it's a huge pleasure for me actually to be able to introduce this webinar, um, an industry perspective of approaches and control strategy for the implementation of ready to use cells in bioassays. Um, you can see all my lovely presenters on the screen now. Um, so what we're going to run through today is um, I'll do an introduction to Bioforum and then Samina from Lonza will talk through the considerations that uh, are needed for using ready to use cells in bioassays. Jay from BMS will look at the generation and some of the logistics around making cell banks. And then Petra from Merck and Co Incorporated will talk to us about the logistics for storage and how the cells are transported and frozen. Um, Clearly, once you've been through all of that, the release strategy and assay performance is really important. And Adi from Fairing will talk us through that. And you might also be wondering, you know, actually, how do ready to use cells perform compared to cultured cells? And John White from GSK is going to share some interesting data on that for you. You're all worrying about life cycle management, I'm sure. So what do you do with ready to use cells for analytical testing? And ESAM um, from BMS will walk you through that. Eva from UCB will um, share the conclusions and some future perspectives. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A session with a panel. So um, that's what we plan to talk you through today. So thank you for my speakers for popping their cameras up. So um, we'll walk through the presentation now. So, so what is Bioforum? Um, we're a collaboration um, and we look at bringing about change within the biopharmaceutical industry. We bring together technical leaders and experts and they form communities on specific topics. And by building these partnerships and teams, really it replaces isolation with collaboration. You know how wonderful to have a group of people who have exactly the same problems that you have, but actually a different perspective on a new solution to that problem. And ultimately that makes your journey better, faster and cheaper than it would be for you by yourselves. In Bioforum, we currently have 12 forums that span biopharmaceutical development. And one of those forums is the development group. So we have 35 member companies and 13 collaborative work streams on different topics, so we very much focus on up to BLA. There are around a thousand active participants and the bioassay um, work stream is one of the work streams and that started in 2016. The views we're going to share with you today are actually shared by the whole of the bioassay work stream and they're not attributed to the individual positions of the participating companies. And actually, those companies are of various sizes with diverse product portfolios and a huge range of different business models. So we think that the survey results we're going to share with you are representative of overall industry practices. The Bioforum Bioassay Works team uh, undertook several benchmarking exercises, drafting questions and discussing the responses on the calls. Um, and these were um, questions would be were responded by up to 36 um, individuals. So, and we think these are all around the area of the use of ready to use cells in good manufacturing and in fact practice and also non-GMP cell-based bioassays. If you want a bit more, a few more details, um, we are lucky enough to say that our paper is now published online in Biotechniques. Um, so it's in its initial phases. It's actually been downloaded almost a thousand times, but it's, we're not, you know, it's still in that online phase. So that's really exciting. So, you know, please have a look at that paper. So now I'm going to hand over to our first speaker and then put my camera off, um, who's going to talk to us about the introduction and considerations for the use of ready to use cells. So Samina, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. So today I'm going to be talking about, my name sorry, is Zamina Ahmed, I'm part of the Global Biological um, Technical Development Team at, here at Onza and today I'll be focusing on the introduction and considerations for use of RTU cells in bioassays. 
So bioassays, as we are aware, including cell-based assays, are an important part of the overall CMC analytical control strategy. And therefore, the need for a robust and reliable bioassays requires the use of analytical cell banks with low lot to lot variability to deliver high quality potency data. And for the purpose of ready to use cells is to improve this long term assay control. The definition of ready to use RTU cell banks are either immortalized or primary cells that are used directly from frozen stock with little to no culture. And we have used the overarching term ready to use going forward, um, referred to as RTUs, and this covers following the covers the following commonly used terminologies which include assay ready cells, thaw and use, ready to plate, RTU cells, thaw and plate, etc. The overview from the Bioforum survey responses showed that the key advantages for RTU cells were increased scheduling flexibility, the improved consistency in assay performance compared to propagation banks where cellular changes that occur over time in culture could impact assay performance. RTU banks are less resource intensive with a reduced requirement for laboratory personnel, equipment, consumables and footprint. Storage requirements to accommodate large RTU cell banks is considered a critical part of inventory management. This also leads to an increased operational efficiency, which is shown by time saving in relation to actual cell handling activities and assay turnaround time, but also to a reduction in potential contamination events during analysis. The use of RTU banks also facilitates a smoother cell-based assay transfer from site to site or site to third party. And in the next few slides, we will focus on some responses from the survey and related considerations. So you'll just have noticed um, an interactive poll that's popped up on your screens um, just to try and gauge at the start of this presentation whether you use ready to use cells. So please respond away. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. So this pre presentation will focus on the key considerations for the implementation of the RTU banks in um, bioassays, as Elaine mentioned earlier. And this includes the technical considerations related to the generation and logistics for the preparation of RTU banks, the comparative assessment between propagation and RTU cell banks, use, including a case study, and the quality control of RTU banks using the principles behind method life cycle management, release strategy and future perspectives for RTUs in the industry. And one of the first questions from the survey was to assess how many respondents used RTU, RTU cell banks in the industry. And here the majority, 81%, responded to uh, have implemented RTU cell banks in, in cell-based assays. Do we have the results of the poll yet? Okay. We do, we do. Um, so the easiest way to just pop it on the screen oh, is great. here. Thank you. Brilliant. So that, the trend is the same, so thank you. Um, the next survey question then was related to the types of cell lines selected for a RTU bank. Um, both primary or mortalized cell lines have been used to establish RTU banks, with 17 respondents implementing RTU banks for immortalized cell lines, with an each showing an equal distribution between suspension and adherent cell lines. Four respondents uh, prepared RTU banks for primary cells, and there are obvious advantages for using RTU, the RTU format for primary cell lines, as it's a time-consuming isolation process, which is impacted by a limited supply from a single donor, a known lot-to-lot -lot variability, and limited pass cell passage windows. And it was acknowledged um, during the preparation of adherent RTU cell banks. Um, these can be challenging, as they were more label intensive with respect to culturing and banking procedures. The next survey question focused on the cell handling post thaw for adherent and or primary cell lines, which may require a short pre-assay recovery period to ensure consistent assay performance. And there were three approaches advocated by the respondents, which were optimised based on the cell line characteristics and the related assay performance. And therefore, in conclusion, it is recommended that the detail overview is required before embarking on the journey for preparing RTU banks, considering culture scale up, passage limits, FPS type, freezing conditions and cell handling for use in the assay. So next, we'll move on to the considerations behind the generation and logistics of RTU cell banks, and this will be presented by Jay. Thank you. 
Thanks, Amina. Hey, everyone. I'm Jay Chen. I'm part of the BioEasy Center of Excellence at the Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, we're located in New Brunswick, New Jersey. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, generation and logistic of RTU cell banks. Uh, in end, uh, next slide, please. So there are two major cell banking strategies used by the uh, member company to generate RTU cell banks. Uh, the standard way is um, Actually, by majority of them, 12 out of 20, they use the master cell bank, then working cell bank, then generation or two cell banks. Um, then eight of them, actually, um, they generate two-tiered uh, cell banking strategy. So the, from master cell bank, then directly generating RTU cell banks. Also, there are a small percentage, um, the reported to utilizing commercial supply of RTU cells only. So there are no cell banking uh, discussed. So decision as to whether a two-tier or three-tiered uh, cell banking system should be employed um, are impacted by a number of factors, including uh, testing demand, the uh, bank size, and also the number of the RTU cell banks really are likely to be made um, over the uh, product life cycle. Ultimately, uh, it's very important that a master cell bank is not depleted during the product life cycle. The RTU cell bank uh, configuration also discussed the next in the lower panel here. The consideration for the size of the bank, uh, not only including the number of the vial per bank, also should affect in the number uh, cell number density per vial and the vial size. All these factors informed by the cell base is a format on um, operational needs and the cell line specific um, capabilities. So most of the um, respondent generating RTU bank of 100, 200 vials per batch and also the considerable number of company are able to generate RTU bank more than 200 vials, likely aided by automated dispensing or control rate freezer. Certainly one more note here, um, the large cell bank uh, has advantage over smaller uh, banks. It's certainly not surprisingly, and it's also preferred as each RTU bank and requires quantification for GMP testing, uh, which can take time, resource, and can be costly. Uh, we'll talk about the, the cell bank quantification next, uh, but for large bank, it's definitely translated to less uh, cell um, bank quantification activities. So RTU banks are a uh, critical reagent. Um, they can be generated in non-GMP and a GMP um, environment. Um, as a critical reagent, they should be um, quantified um, for use in the GMP laboratory for um, performance consistency either by using the bank in method validation or by performing a cell bank uh, quantification. For this, um, the ASA developer needs to decide appropriate release ASAs and release criteria uh, to how they can release these uh, banks. So this uh, we're not going to talk about today in the webinar. For more information, you can refer to the paper. Most of the response as shown in the pie chart, they follow a protocol with pre-approved criteria for the release of the RTU cell banks. And also, most of respondents do issue a certificate of analysis for RTU cell banks um, that are used um, for the QC release testing. Uh, next slide, please. Next survey question is about the source of the cell line and where the banks are made. So the, num the cell uh, line used for RTU banks could be either in-house developed cell line or could be the commercial available cell lines. There are also a number of options of cell banking sites, um, could be in-house by CDMO, or by uh, commercial vendors. As you can see in the pie chart here, majority of respondents are showing the dark blue and the light blue. Uh, in the pie chart, uh, use in-house developed cell line. They either generate cell bank in-house or via CDMO. Then nine of them reported exclusively purchase um, off-the-shelf RTU vials uh, from the commercial vendors. The challenges uh, with outsourcing of RTU production to CDMO also highlight in the survey as seen in this uh, table on the left side, uh, the challenges um, collected here, including difficulty in scaling up, unsatisfactory cell bank quantity or quantity, and RTU lot consistency. Um, then all the respondents recommended several control measures to improve this aspect, um, as shown in the right side of the table, including specifying cell culture scale up process, uh, detailing cell banking uh, reagent, cell handling instruction, and the freezing process. It's also very important uh, to, to have small pilot batches made and then by the CDMO then uh, for client evaluation prior to the full-size large scale of banking. So next, I'm going to pass on to Petra uh, to discuss logistics, how RTU cells are made and frozen.
Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Petra Bennington. I'm joining you from Kenilworth in New Jersey, where I lead uh, Merck's R&D biological characterization team. And I will be sharing with you what the Bioform survey highlighted in terms of the logistical considerations for ready-to-use cells in terms of banking, freezing, and distribution. So what's specific for the ready-to-use banks is you have to have a sufficient expansion to ensure the suitability high cell concentration per vial. Typically, you're aiming for one vial per bioassay, as, as Jay has walked us through. Many companies do more than 200 vials per bank, and you also want the lowest possible passage. So because the RTU banks are typically quite large, the majority of responders were still using primarily manual aliquoting, but a growing number of labs is implementing automation, which obviously provides advantages for speed and consistency. Some of the logistical challenges for that needs to be solved because you need the cell banks to be sterile, so placing the automation in BSC cabinet or using specialized enclosures is typically the solutions that the responders would reach for. In terms of the preferred mode of freezing, only a minority of responders were using uncontrolled freezing conditions, and a common practice is using our you know familiar semi-controlled manual devices like Mr. Frosty's where you place it in minus 80 before transfer to liquid nitrogen. However, what was very encouraging is the majority of responders already transitioned to the controlled rate freezers, which offer speed and consistent control over the freezing process. And this is typically also what a CRO would use if you outsource the ready-to-use uh, banking you know, outside of your company. What we would like to stress is what is of utmost importance is optimization of your cell freezing protocol as part of ready-to-use cell assay development. It can really have a major impact on the success or failure of the ready-to-use cell-based assay development. And you can find out more aspects on that in the publication. So in one of those most important aspects of the successful freezing protocol is optimization of the freezing media. A majority of the responders used, you know, typical growth media with or without FBS and DMSO as the cryopreservant or just straight up serum with DMSO. The type of serum that is used is generally mandated by the specific assay needs, you know, inactivated, dialyzed, gamma irradiated. Um, still a minority, 3 out of 27, but there is a growing evidence of potential for using serum-free media, which has a lot of um, um, advantages. There are commercially available formulations now available on the market, and avoiding animal products like fetal bovine serum, fetal bovine albumin from the matrix of the ready-to-use cells provides useful advantages for global transfers of the banks, eliminating, for example, the need for veterinary certifications or import permits. In the next slide, um, I think the actual logistics for the ready-to-use banks, so not unsimilar to other analytical cell banks that are critical reagents. What is very important, especially if you have a global regulatory strategy and potentially requirements for local testing on import, your logistics and distribution is a very important aspect. The ready-to-use banks, as we have heard earlier, are considered critical reagents, and as such, the type of shipment needs to be reflect the complexity and length of the shipment. If you are doing domestic, international, the criticality of the bank when you're dividing your critical regions and multiple shipments and feasibility of the different types of shippers. You know, do they have availability of, of liquid nitrogen uh, doers, dry ice carriers, and what the carriers might be limited to based on the country where you are importing or exporting to. The dry ice shipments uh, based on the responses are still the most common and planning should always include top up of the dry ice for international shipments uh, to, to warrant for potentially delays like quarantines. The dry ice shipments should not be, uh, might not be suitable for some of the cell lines. There is an evidence that, for example, cell lines sensitive to low pH do not tolerate the dry ice shipment well. And a substantial portion of the responders is now shifting to using liquid nitrogen doer shippers, where you're shipping in a vapor phase of liquid nitrogen, which offers lower consistent temperature up to 14 days, and that depends on the size and the model of the shipment, and if needed, also allows you to refill during the transport. So I think I would be handing it over to Adi to walk us through the release strategy for SA performance. Thanks, Petra. Um, I'm Adi kuzminski ATS, heading the Biological SA Development Group in Fering, and I would now like to discuss with you the proposed release strategy of ready-to-use banks. Qualification of an RTU bank depends on the number of vials prepared. For banks smaller than 200 vials, minimum of three vials are recommended, while for banks larger than 200 vials, most companies use more than three vials. 
Moreover, most companies recommend to test vials from the beginning, middle, and end of the filling process, this to ensure consistency across the cell banking process. Qualification of, ready, of cell banks is an essential uh, and performed to assure robust performance. In general, for most parameters, there are less testing performed on ready-to-use banks compared to master or working cell banks. The most common release parameter used by the majority of the companies are viability, sterility, mycoplasma, and assay performance. While some parameters are less commonly used, for example, doubling time or biomarker expression. Additionally, screening of adventitious viruses is sometimes performed for release of master cell bank, for example, nine of the 20 respondents, whereas only few respondents confirmed doing testing in working or ready to use banks, two to three of the 20 responders respectively. Moreover, some of the parameters like identity are mostly performed on master cell banks by about half of the responders, while only one responder performs identity also on the ready-to-use bank. Most responders qualify RTU banks according to essay performance by passing the SSTs and acceptance criteria, which are justified based on historical data performance of the essay. Next, please. Another important aspect is the stability of a RTU cell bank. Usually, expired dates are not set on cell banks. Most responders assess stability by performance of routine testing and comparing the performance of historical method trends and data-driven control limits. A smaller portion of the companies perform dedicated experiments to monitor stability, and there are some companies that use the mixed approach between these two strategies or a business-driven decisions. Next. One of the important aspects in a qualification of RTU cells is the difference in the performance between RTU and the culture cell format. As you can see, most responders accept some changes in the parameters like EC50, signal window, and background. In general, small changes in any of the parameters are acceptable, according to the survey, as long as the essay is still meeting the required performance criteria. Next, we'll go a bit into detail on the specific curve performance parameters and how much of a difference in the curve performance parameters are acceptable when we compare RTU to a culture cell format. So for the EC50, parameter, half of the responders accept less than two-fold difference in EC50, half accept a uh, two to ten-fold difference, and no responders accept a difference greater than tenfold. For the signal to ratio parameter, signal ratio parameter, a decrease at the ratio of 10 to even 80 percent is acceptable, but this is very dependent on the initial essay window. Moreover, differences in slope of the curve can also be acceptable. About half of the responders accept a difference of 0.1%. Next. For cell viability, majority of the responders accept viability values of 85 to 95%, and also majority require CV of the replicates to be less than 20%. I will now pass to John to share a case study on the comparison of RTU and culture cells. Thank you, Eddie. So we talked about uh, the generation and the logistics of RTU cells. Uh, we've talked about the storage of RTU cells and the release and cell performance criteria of RTU cells. It's important in the next slide that we look at the some case studies of RTU cells. Particularly, this is particularly important if you are using interchangeably RTU cells and cultured cells in the same method. And so what we chose here were four different mechanisms of action of RTU cells where members had compared the performance of the cultured cells with the RTU cells. And these are labeled example A, B, C, and D. 
And as you can see from example A, the criteria, which are the system suitability and assay suitability criteria for the assays are very close, particularly in the EC50 between the cultured cells and the RTU cells. As, as Adi mentioned, the A to D window is also a very important criteria. The upper and lower asymptote and the B parameter, and particularly the percent CV were all very close in this example A. And these represent four different mechanisms of action for RTU cells and cultured cells. In example B, again, you can see that the examples of the EC50, the ADD window, the upper and lower asymptotes, for instance, are all very similar to each other. So under these conditions, the ready to use cells and the cultured cells perform identically to each other. And so a single system suitability criteria could be applied whether you're using cultured cells or RTU cells. In the next two examples, C and D, exactly the same pattern is, is shown where you can optimize the, the RTU cells to perform adequately in comparison with the cultured cells. And again, the EC50, the ATD window, upper and lower asymptotes are all very similar in both the example C and example D. So by managing the development of the RTU cells, the freezing conditions, et cetera, equivalence can be drawn between cultured cells and RTC to use cells. And obviously this is important if you want to use these interchangeably or if a, if a CRO cannot deal with RTU cells but has to uh, grow cultured cells, the, the same cells can be used interchangeably between the two methods when you get similarities between the system suitability parameters of the assay. And now I'm going to pass over to Isam, who's going to talk about the life cycle management of RTU cells. Hello, my name is Isam Bakush. I am with the BioIC Center of Excellence at Bristol Myers Book here in New Jersey. I'm going to talk about managing the life cycle of your RTU banks. So, this is a summary of information gathered to understand considerations that need to be taken when managing the life cycle of our two banks. Our two banks need to be treated as critical reagents, and that's not only to ensure consistency between the banks and suitability use, but also so you don't have cells. First consideration is, is the production site. You need to document the site at which the bank is produced and the procedure used to, to generate the bank as well. If it's a, a commercial source, then you need to document the catalog number along with any other information that's necessary to maintain traceability. The procedure used to generate the banks should be an established procedure and it needs to be documented. And this is to ensure consistency between the banks and also to be able to identify any, any failures that may be due to issues that occur during production. Documentation should include not just the passage number of the cells used to make the banks, but also a lot of the critical reagents that were used to generate the banks, such as the media, FPS supplements, as well as the recent conditions. Uh, for your commercially obtained banks, the CRO records should be documented and lot numbers or any information that you need to maintain traceability. The testing of the bank essentially serves to qualify your bank. Testing can include viability, sterility, or assay performance as well. Criteria for each of these tests should be predefined in protocol or, or procedure, and the outcome of each of these tests should be captured in a C of A or report that can be referenced every time it's used. Banks should be stored in a designated location in under suitable storage conditions. And this ensures maintenance of chain of custody of your banks and no uh, excursions from the required storage conditions. Maintaining accurate control charts, which monitor not just your assay performance, but also the critical method parameters and cell data, such as viability from the routine testing using the bank. These can provide good indicators for continued stability and suitability of your bank. And using these charts to identify trends can provide indicators for when a bank may be beginning to fail or to help establish expected operating ranges to assess the impact of a particular excursion or anything. Exceptional condition. And monitoring usage rates and burn rates is especially important. 
for our GU banks, considering the increased expected usage of the virus. So you should plan reordering or rebanking activities well in advance to allow for enough time to begin testing in any type of qualification that needs to be done prior to exhausting the curve bank and avoiding interruptions to the programs. This is a flowchart that guides you through introducing and implementing RTU cells at various points prior to early and through your commercial development. In general, you can see along the bottom there, flow demonstrates an increase in the level of complexity and considerations that need to be taken when you want to introduce your cells later in development. Starting on the left, if your RTU cells are available at the time when your mechanistic is relevant method is conceived, you can use your RTU cells along with your propagated cells in your development activities. In both RTU cells and propagated cells can be used in both the early phase method qualification as well as the late phase method validation to allow for transfer of a method to commercial testing sites, which in the best case scenario would be an option for using either a propagated cell option or an RTU cell option. Now, if the RTU cells are not available during your method design or your method development due to accelerated timelines or any other reason, uh, propagated cells can be used to, to qualify your method to support your early clinical development. And if you're ready to implement your RTU cells after qualification, you can generate an RTU bank from the cells that are used in your propagated option and compare performance of your method using RTU cells to your method using propagated cells. And that should be sufficient to use an RTU option to support your development. The late phase method development should include both. So if you do a full validation with the RTU cells and propagated cells as well, and if that's not an option, then you need to demonstrate statistical equivalence between the method performance using both options, the RTU and the propagated cell model to support your native phase of method development and to allow for transfer of final method including both options to the commercial testing sites. Lastly, if the RQ cells are not available for implementation after qualification and validation is performed using only propagated cells, a separate method validation would be necessary using the RQ cells, followed by bridging study to bridge the two methods. And you would also need to update any filings that exist in regions around the world to include the additional method to support your implement based on the virtual method. This chart represents a poll of the members for strategies used to implement, implement the RTU cells. Of course, as we talked about, uh, you have to consider the phase of development to determine what you need to do to implement the cells. However, in general, most organizations perform a statistically based determination of cohorts. <clears throat> and that can include evaluations of the recovery of a QC sample or spike samples from known potency. Um, it can include looking at variability between results or intermediate precision, and it can also include uh, other exit parameters, such as CV between replicates or different curve parameters, asymptotes, or slopes. Five members uh, reported using a uh, complete revalidation of the method as an option to ensure the method is suitable for use uh, using it for team cells. And in some cases, members use the information data gathered in control charts to demonstrate sufficient equivalence of the method using R2 cells to the historical the performance that was established in the control charts. We, I'll pass it on to have to talk about conclusions and future perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Isam, and hello, everyone. My name is Eva Martinez, and I'm part of the Analytical Development Sciences for Biologicals in UCB Pharma. So to finalize this webinar, I would like to highlight the benefits of using ready-to-use cells. As we have heard today, there are several advantages. First, we can obtain a substantial improvement in assay performance. This is due to the consistent quality of cell stocks that ready-to-use cells bank provide. 
by using a standardized cell source, we can eliminate a significant amount of variability in our assays, which is a common challenge in biological experiments. Second, the provision of a frozen bank of uniform cell stock for direct use in assays has been a game changer because it eliminates the need for extensive subculturing, which not only saves time, but also reduces the risk of cell line drift and contamination, what, as you know, are common issues when cells are cultured for extended periods. Also, the reduction in labor and resource requirements. With ready-to-use cell banks, we streamline our work workflows. We lead to improved efficiency. And this efficiency gain translates to cost savings and allows our researchers to focus on more critical aspects of their work. So in conclusion, the adoption of ready-to-use cell banks is not just a logistical improvement, but also strategic enhancement on the reliability of our experimental data. Next slide. Here. In this slide, I would also like to summarize the key findings from our survey, what have helped establish common practices that will enhance our work. The timing for the introduction of ready-to-use cell bank is crucial and the consensus suggests incorporating them as early as possible during method development and prior to method validation. This early integration sets a solid foundation for consistent acid results. We have, we have also identified a preferred to tire cell bank system, the master cell bank and the working cell bank, also apply to the propagation cell model. This ensures a stable and reliable supply of cell stocks for ongoing and future assays. Importantly, ready-to-use cell banks are considered critical reagents, so it's recommended to establish robust criteria and perform a thorough testing before they're using experiments. This uh, will ensure quality and reliability. Lastly, it has been agreed that minor differences between propagated and ready-to-use cells are acceptable, provided that the assay performance remains consistent. This pragmatic approach acknowledges the realities of biological variation while maintaining the integrity of our data. So in essence, the incorporation of ready-to-use cell banks following these established practices is elevating the standard and reproducibility of our experimental assays. Next slide, please. Thank you. Finally, looking ahead, we anticipate a transformative combination, ready to use cells paired with full automation. This synergy is expected to provide flexibility, eliminating therefore the need for routine cell culture and dramatically increase the throughput due to automation. The most exciting aspect of this integration is the potential to reduce assay variability and significantly boost the reliability. Furthermore, stability and release testing will significantly benefit from the use of ready to use cell banks. These banks will streamline the logistical aspects of acid preparation, facilitating more efficient planning and resource allocation. This means less time spent on cell maintenance and more on the critical analysis, enhancing the speed and efficiency at which we can deliver our results. Yeah. Thanks, Eva. <laughs> so it remains for me to thank my wonderful presenters and the authors of the paper, and in fact, the whole of the bioassay workstream for their enthusiasm and uh, lively discussions that took place on this topic um, during the phase of, of uh, quite some time. Um, so if you want to go ahead and look at the paper, then please do. We have one last poll for you, which I'm just launching now. Um, and that's to see if you haven't used ready to use cells um, before today, after what you've heard, um, you know, will you think about it? Uh, will you look at using ready to use cells? Um, so, oh, so of the goodness me, that's that's uh, yeah, that that's really great. So out of the subsection of people who hadn't used the ready to use cells before, there's a significant number of people who are now looking to use uh, ready to use cells in their bioassays. So, so I think that's a result. Um, so yeah, fantastic.